Unbox the radio, the AM stereo prototype that's going to be the star of yet another YouTube video. Let's see how it does here. Is that getting in the way? No, you're good. I'm not good at this. I'm really hoping you used an excessive amount of cellophane. Probably. I know Shangle likes cellophane. Ooh, and we, well, we got, we got a, ooh, peanuts. I'm hungry. Yeah. All right. We didn't get in trouble for having that this time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ooh, we, and we got parts and schematic. What we got here? Oh, yeah. Oh, parts yeah. and schematic. This, is, this must be the parts kit that goes with the radio that came with it. Probably from... Oh, probably from... The Motorola, Labor Motorola Laboratory, probably, yeah. That could be. Yeah, that might Oh, look at that. Thing. Copy of Radio Electronics. Ooh. Oh. On AM stereo, build the Sequam stereo AM decoder for your radio. That's cool. That's going to be a lot like the one that you got off the web, like probably. That, yeah, probably looks a lot. That like looks that a little. One. Yeah, it looks a little different. Mine's a little bit smaller. Okay, so we have adapters. All right, you know, the reflection here, or speakers, or something. Oh, that's the camera we need to do to use for oh, the perfect. for okay. the real video we're going to be doing. That looks like everything shipped pretty well here. It's it's in one it's, piece. It's intact. That's that's good. This is lightweight. This is a lot lighter than I thought it would be. Well, but it made it in one piece. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to cheat. Right up with the knife. There it is. We're going to cheat. Well, uh, using the uh, term of radio TV photo, not at least it wasn't cream puff. So. There you go. <laughs> there you go. This it's is... usually courtesy United Parcel Smashers. Came in one piece. All right, there she is. God, isn't it I feel just... like I'm holding something famous. Oh, yeah. Well, it kind of is. You know, there's only one of these, so yeah. don't drop it. No, we put it on the bench. <laughs> that goes on the bench. And, and got, uh, more stuff. We more stuff. Speakers. I'm thinking these might be the speakers, yeah. These are probably powered speakers or unpowered speakers or something. We'll have to repack carefully later. Yep, little speakers. All right, looks good. Because we got to try this here and see if it runs. Right. Speaker one. Not to be confused with thing one and thing two. Speaker two. They're cute. Speaker two. All right. And, oh my Ooh. goodness, we've got more stuff. This is probably, probably. a power supply. Oh. This is probably the power nice. supply. There's the tripod for doing the videos we're going to be doing. Oh, yeah. Little. And the tape stuck to the plastic. Of course. Nice repurposing of the Dorman box. Yeah. I, I always build all my batteries in Dorman boxes. There we go. <laughs> so that must be... A VBT solenoid or something? I'm thinking that's the power supply for the that's whole thing. That's probably uh, the battery pack he built for it. Oh, wow. Okay, yep. Yep. Oh, so good. that's okay. that's that's the power supply for So that's for good to it. go. All right. And I think that's it. And so we got something over there. Got something over here? Nope. More more pieces, parts for the next video. Oh, camera, tripod yep. mount. Yep, yep. yep. Okay. And there's the tripod. All right. Hey, we'll put all that back in there carefully. Oop. Oh, but wait. More. There's more. There's more. More battery. Is that, that more could battery? Be. It feels like it. It's like Christmas. Only this stuff we got to send back when we're done. Ah. Oh, we have an AC. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. ah, this okay. is the part where it can run on AC instead yes. of DC. He, he made that up for us. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of that group before. AC DC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they'd sound good in AM stereo. So it's here. Now we'll try it out. All right. So we're here at WION Engineering Department. Uh, we've received the radio from Shango that we just unboxed. And uh, we've got everything wired up. There's the output jacks. We got the two speakers hooked up. We are running on battery. And Jim, why don't you go ahead and flick the switch and see what we get. We have sound. That's good. Not good sound. Any AM stereo indicator? They installed it over here. Okay. Barely. Barely? Okay, well, that's promising. But Ooh. it sounds really yeah. bad. We do have a lot of distortion on yep. one, possibly both channels. So, well, Greg's on his way, right? Our engineer? Absolutely. Mr. He'll be AM here. AM stereo? And... Okay. Well, why don't we... Uh, why don't we have him get his hands into it and kind of see if we can uh, figure out what's going on here and if anyone can figure it out, it's, it's probably him. Yeah, there's 
that crime yeah. one. Yeah. Yep. Does it not like our 120 some percent? <laughs> well, oh, thank no. It did that crack on my house. Too, uh, so kind of it'll be fine. Um, you got the scope and a probe? Scope down there. Underneath the, uh, pla oh, the white plastic right there. We have a probe for it. It appears to be locked right now. That unlocked it. Yeah. Alright, now, I, we need a, did he send a schematic? Or any kind of documentation? Yes, we have a box. The priority mailbox right there has everything that he sent us. Oh, no, go to the go to the right. The white box. Yeah. Yep. Oh, perfect. What I need is right on top here. All right, so we're gonna look at cosine phi and see if it's slamming. The error amplifier. That's it. Pin five. One, two, three. That's actually clean. I'm not seeing the crackle in there. Five. Oh, cosine phi is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Oh, double burst in there. I-1430 is a unique radio station. WION is where you'll hear songs you thought you'd forgotten. Okay, so what we want to do, I'm going to turn the transmitter to mono. Go for it. So we're running on the battery pack right now, and we have the scope, and we're going to turn the transmitter to mono, because the engineer says turn it to mono. That crackling is annoying. If you took that out of it, it would be pretty decent stereo when it's stereo, especially for the small speakers that it has. There it went away. It cleaned up in mono. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, like I said, when you're on mono, it's fine. It cleaned up beautifully. But I want to see what's going on here now. Yeah, see, there should be no, none of that action at all. Just a flat line? That should be a flat line because we're transmitting mono. So that's telling me... There's a lot of mistuning in here. And yeah, we'll be able to fix that. Q detector has got output, which there should be none. I and Q look good. E and I. Okay. So this should have no action on it at all. That should be a flat line. That should be a flat line. So, should sh no modulation at all because of it mono? Right. And we know the transmitter is clean, so... We certainly do. Best sounding AM in the nation. <laughs> nice commercial. Thank you. The PLL is locking perfectly. Prime Minister Liz Truss paid tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth II during a session of Parliament today. So the crackling when it's in stereo is it amplifying that problem? It's that's because in this receiver the mistuning is causing lots of uh, wow. That's PLL is not locked. Now it's there, it's just locked. The Queen. Crowds have gathered. Flags have been lowered to Let's see, there should be no tributes have been sent. No information there at all in mono. So that's mistuning in the IF okay. or distortion in the IF. So, um, see that's the audio amp part. That's the bass treble balance. So it's somewhere in here. So we're trying to get rid of the clipping that it gets while it's... Okay, now it's really got a ton of signal, I'm sure. Okay. So we'll find out. So is that the AGC oh, yeah. you're working on, or...? I'm trying to see it now. It's totally clipping on RF. It doesn't show on this because it's bright, but I under I see okay. what you're doing. On, this, on the screen, it's just solid light up. Yep. So now we need to load that. You need to install something I wish there. We had the correct schematic, but 
Yeah, we're having trouble. The schematic for this does not match. 12-655 or 656A or 656 just does not match this. So what we did is we actually opened up the envelope detector on the radio because we're trying to figure out where the clipping's occurring. And it's in the IF stage, but we're not sure where yet. Um, we don't have a proper schematic, so we have to kind of reverse engineer what's going on here. And of course the power is off when we're doing this. <laughs> right, but it's going to be on in a second here. And we'll see if we have restored the audio. Oops. And we have. Okay. So, and if we, I don't know if you can see the scope, but you can see the uh, comes in. The, there we go. Let me, let me come around. So the negative modulation is showing up well, but the positive modulation is extremely limited. We're clipping in the IF stage. And when I open, I will go ahead and open that diode one more time so you can see. And that stage has, is allowed to run full open loop gain. So now it's going to be running full open loop gain. And it's just nothing but distortion. And you can see here the clipping occurring. It's barely showing any modulation. So we're going to have, go ahead and restore that. But the signal going into the stereo decoder is not only too high, the level's too high. But it's also um, the IF gain or IF stage gain here is too high, and we're clipping the audio. So we need to figure out why and fix it. Okay, so what we found is that the AIM stereo decoder board was connected at the top, and if we can go to the schematic over here, uh -huh. it was connected here at the point where the diode is. It's on a high impedance or fairly high impedance winding of this transformer, and as the diode is beginning to go into conduction, it actually changes the impedance. So through the modulation cycle, the AM modulation cycle, this impedance is changing radically. So what I did is I came back here, and it looks like it had previously been connected to this emitter resistor. This is a low impedance point. There's still plenty of signal there. Uh, we want roughly 600 millivolts RMS and we've got easily that. We've got too much yet. So we've come off that point and gone to the stereo, stereo decoder and now we don't have the impedance variation from the uh, from the diode anymore. We're not coming off the collector of this device. We're using this as an emitter follower, a, a very low impedance source for the AIM stereo decoder. And the performance is actually quite good. Um, our remaining problem now is one of pure overload. So what we've done is instead of tuning to 1430, we've tuned to the image 900 kilohertz below. We've got a lot of loss in the front end. Because of that, the, the, the TRF section, the tuned section, which is, this is a double tuned RF front end on this receiver, is so far out of tune, we've got probably 20 or 30 dB of loss. So by doing that, and as we turn it back on, you'll see it'll come on eventually. It says somewhere in the book. Oh. And we have Wednesday AM stereo Just indicated that I could tune through. Night here at the Lamp Stop in and help tune us celebrate it in. 18 years It'll go to of stereo, great music. And on there's local no radio clipping. With some delicious it's food clean and audio. specials. Plus free ice cream for dessert. And Compliments of WIOM 92.7 FM. And be sure to check out the weekend soup and salad bar. Friday from 11 till 9, Saturday from 4 till 9. All at the Lamplight Grill, your place for great tasting specials in downtown Ionia. Cooler weather is here, and with it comes cool deals from Young Chevrolet. So, and we've actually got very clean audio here. This receiver 
seems to produce about 5 kilohertz response almost flat since it's a um, you know a, a couple of tuned IF stages there's no ceramic filter in this version the older versions and this only schematic we could find have a ceramic filter but since they're not in here it's actually a very gradual roll off uh, far enough that it actually complements the NRSC pre-emphasis on the transmitter pretty well so it's a it's a it's now a working um, good sounding the best receiver sales and, services and would work county. better if off site from a station right so we'll take this receiver off site and get some audio recordings off air right here and this this actual line of receivers is known for overload if you you know look elsewhere on the web you'll see people talking about how they overload near strong transmitter sites so but I, I think that one fairly minor change of where we take the input to the stereo decoder to a low, low impedance buffered point made all the difference in the world and it does look like looking underneath the board that it was previously connected there so not sure why anybody changed it or why it was changed but uh, so this is not the good. way it was when it left Motorola. I doubt it I believe this was done by a gentleman named Ken Steiner who I worked with. Ken passed away about a year ago and um, I think it would not have left the lab. Ken was meticulous um, and it would have left the board layout. It would have left with full stereo not the blob that had to be removed right. when our host had it. Right so somebody decided to use this for other purposes and they just wanted distance. It. Yeah. They just want a distance. And, and I, I believe what they were trying to do was get more gain, um, therefore have a more sensitive receiver for long distance DX. And didn't need stereo. It didn't need stereo, so they went to that high impedance point on that final transformer. Uh, that also narrowed the bandwidth up because you've got that final transformer, that tuned stage, at 450 or 450 kilohertz. Um, we've eliminated that and gone back to what was probably its initial intent. And we should note that even at 500 watts, I'm sorry, 330 watts, it was still overloading here. Right. On site, even but, in the building and a few hundred feet from the tower. Right, but um, let's, let me grab the meter and I'll, we'll look at the signal strength here. Okay, so this is a field strength meter. It's used by radio stations to make sure that their uh, directional arrays are properly aligned. And so here we are in the engineering room, 10 volt, uh, per 10 volt full scale. And as you can see, when we max it out, we go through the whole cal process and everything, we're at six volts per meter here. <laughs> that's an incredibly strong signal. Um, and you know, that's gonna overload just about any receiver that's out there, um, especially one with a ferrite bar antenna. Uh, we're just coupling so much energy into here. Uh, typical signal strength in the field is going to be at most hundreds of millivolts per meter, not volts per meter like we're seeing here. So for tomorrow. Barry Scott's Lost 45s is coming up. Songs you might have forgotten about, but you still love and the stories and artists behind them. Brought to you by the Lamplight Grill in downtown Ionia, it's the Lost 45s with Barry Scott tonight from 6 to 9. Only right here. And that's your forecast from WION AM Stereo 1430 FM 92.7 and 100.3 in Lowell. Yeah, and we're tuned to the image frequency. That's right. Yeah, yep. forgot about that. If we if we tune to the main frequency, it's the, the radio is so overloaded. But there's not It'll an AJC. Clip it clips like mad. I mean, six volts per meter is just too much. Too much to even kick it in. Yeah. Oh. It tries. It tries. The stereo is actually better than the mono. The mono's clip, but. Oh, let's go back to the bottom of the dial. <laughs> let's go back to the image of. Here, we're getting. There's all kinds of images here. With that kind of voltage Spurs. in the air, I'd imagine there should be. Yeah. 
So we're still at 2,500 watts of our 47 that we're allowed. And then it'll snap in here. It's pretty nice stereo. I don't think I'd stream with it, but it's pretty darn nice. Yeah. Not bad for a uh, approaching 40-year-old conversion. What we're doing here is we're taking the left channel output, one side going, one port going to the speaker, the other left channel port, we've got a Y adapter here, is going off to the oscilloscope and feeding the X axis of the oscilloscope. The right channel goes to the right speaker, and it's also being split to feed the y-axis of the oscilloscope. So that's how we get this Lissajou pattern that's showing us you know, the mono L plus R out of 45 and then all of the stereo content. So it's exactly yeah. from this radio and not from something in our rack. Right. So, unfortunately, it's volume dependent because it's coming off of that pot. But I'll model it for a moment. All right. There's mono. Pretty good mono. Darn nice mono as mono goes. And then back to the dancing steel wool. That's what I call this, the dancing steel wool. Let me move over to the radio here. And we're actually transmitting in mono again here. Through the broadcast electronics transmitter. Back. back to full fidelity stereo. Now it's throwing mono and changing to mono again. Bring her back. Now a moment of silence as it goes to the next song because I didn't put a tone on this one to take us to the next song. No sec tone there. Oh, another good choice. We're here at Bertha Brock Park, a couple of miles away from the transmitter site for WION. We've got the radio running here. We made the modifications back in the shop at WION. Um, Back there we had to tune the radio to the lower image, down 900 kilohertz below 1430 instead of on 1430. And that gave us about probably 30 dB of attenuation through the IF, so the radio wouldn't overload. Uh, lineup on this radio is pretty simple. It's a handful of transistors and a fed up front. Um, pretty simple AGC circuit. And even the online comments about this radio when it was a product stated that they were prone to overload if you got close to a station. So here we are at Bertha Brock Park and we're going to uh, go ahead and turn this on again. Um, and now we're tuned to 1430 and um, it's working quite well. Again, the modification we had to make was actually take the point that the AM stereo decoder was being fed from, from the top of the final IF transformer where the diode detector is, where a 1N60 diode is located back to the previous stage um, which is a you know com a, a common emitter circuit and there's a degenerating resistor in the emitter circuit 150 ohms perfect impedance to drive we had plenty of signal there so we used that low impedance point and it looked like it had actually been used uh, there was some solder blobbed up in that area so we just simply went back to to that point and everything's happy now so we'll go ahead and turn this on It popped in the stereo right away. Now 
I'll go ahead and tune it. We can tune down, turn the volume all the way up. We can hear our sister station, 1380, up in Greenville, about 30 miles away. Somewhere here. And uh, we'll just go right back to WION and let it tune back in again. And you can hear it open up in the stereo. There's a lot of stereo content in this Phil Collins song right now. So there's still a couple of issues with this radio, mainly voltage regulation. Um, if we look at the 8 volt supply in the stereo decoder and some of the other voltages, even with the battery, as the amplifier draws current slugs, it's not regulating well and that's translating to a little bit of distortion that we're still hearing, but it's much, much less than we had before. So we're going to do a uh, kind of a discussion here. We've had a number of questions of how is CQAM actually transmitted. And so we're going to do a little math here <laughs> keep it pretty simple but try to give enough so that you know if you if you want to understand a little deeper how it works you know we'll try to get that across to you so we're going to start with let's just say we've got this unmodulated carrier and we've all seen the textbook and I'm a horrible artist but uh, unmodulated carrier this is our carrier at 1430 kilohertz and we're going to impose a sine wave of audio at a kilohertz, and not the scale, of course, onto it. And so that's going to cause envelope modulation to occur in this form. And of course, we've got this carrier in here at 14.30, and this envelope of one kilohertz sitting on top of it. And this is for us is 4700 watts. I'm going to just call it 5 kilowatts to keep it simple. And at this point in time at minus 100% modulation we're transmitting zero power. But at this point in time we've doubled our envelope, or doubled the voltage, and of course it's a square law function is you know, P equals E squared over R. So two times the voltage versus the unmodulated carrier gives us four times the power so on our peak envelope the peak of envelope we're at four times 4700 so almost 20 kilowatts and actually we can do 125 percent modulation so on our peak of modulation we're transmitting almost 25 kilowatts of peak envelope power okay. so this can also be described as an equation and I'm going to go 1 plus m cosine omega ct plus phi. And this may look a little tough for those of us that haven't done math for a while, but 1 is our unmodulated carrier level. It's just a reference term. For us, it means you know, our 4,700 watts of carrier represented by a voltage at the antenna. Cosine omega ct is our carrier frequency in radians per second. Um, so it's 6.28 times 1430 kilohertz. Why do we do it in uh, radians per second or omega ct in radians per second? A lot of other math works out easier when we do that. The plus V term in normal mono broadcasting, that's an additional phase modulation term. So this carrier in here, we can phase modulate it back and forth and convey extra information, but we normally don't in mono. So that term in most transmissions just falls out. It's zero. So we've got 1 plus m, and finally the m is our modulation. That's our, our audio that's imposed on it. So um, at the peak of modulation, we go to 1 plus 100%. 100% equals 1 plus 1 equals 2, and there's our 2 volts. Um, at 1 plus um, 125%, that envelope actually stretches even further. Um, so we have uh, that equals uh, 2.25 times 
the normal unmodulated carrier. Okay, and minus 100%, 1 minus 100% equals 0, the point at which the carrier is fully pinched off. So that describes monomodulation in its simplest form. Um, we're also going to draw what we call vectors. So we have a carrier vector and we have two sidebands. And if we look in the, you know, in the frequency domain, when we modulate the signal, we have carrier and a pair of sidebands. Well, those sidebands, this carrier is rotating at 1430,000 times per second. And then plus or minus one kilohertz from it, um, there's one kilohertz separation between these terms, is our audio, our audio side pans that are, that are caused by the process of modulation. We can draw those as additional vectors. And so in this case, the vectors all add up, vector addition, to form a positive peak of modulation but these vectors are rotating and they can rotate through and when they do we can form our minus 100 percent modulation so this vector is sitting there and I, if we can move the camera for a second that vector is sitting there and it's being amplitude modulated if you can look at this pen I'm moving it up and down think of it as growing that's our amplitude modulation Okay. Well, the really cool thing is something called quadrature modulation. We could put a second vector exactly 90 degrees in relationship to the carrier. And if I look at it this way, you could see this vector change. But if you're head on, as I change this vector, nothing happens from your point of view until I rotate my axis, now all of a sudden this vector changes and this one remains stationary. And this is our vector that has the AM modulation term and this is a second quadrature term. So we have two separate paths that are truly available to us to transmit information. And in AM stereo, we use that second quadrature term to send the information. So if I draw a vector, now it's not just simply a pair of what we call in-phase sidebands that add up to form the instantaneous transmitted carrier vector, but we can have a second set of sidebands in quadrature and they add and that can, con can convey additional information. The problem is what we call envelope compatibility. We want the envelope modulation, you know, one more time, this envelope modulation has to represent L plus R without distortion. The problem is when we add these quadrature carriers, we find the resultant, we end up with a vector that looks like this. Simple vector addition. But if we're going to maintain compatibility, we have what we call a circle of constant power. It forms a circle. And this extra error here is distortion. And in fact, on a single tone, it's a second harmonic distortion. And our waveform begins to look like this as we send quadru quadrature information it begins to look like that and that distortion is going to be heard by every mono lister. So CQAM, C -Q -U -A -M, stands for Compatible Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. And this compatible term is what's important. What we do is we force the vector with the phase modulation, we force the vector back down to be on the circle of constant power so that the envelope is no longer distorted. And how do we do that? Well, let's, tr let's start with a little bit more math. We had our 1 plus m cosine omega ct plus phi. 
Well, we're now phase modulating the carrier for AM stereo. 1 plus M becomes 1 plus L plus R mono with the carrier cosine omega CT plus phi and that phi that phase modulation term equals the arc tangent <laughs> it's going to get a little goofy of L minus R over 1 plus L plus R okay the magic occurs here this is the same um, the same term that would you would use for linear quadrature modulation what was done for Harris for example the Harris broadcast system for stereo but in if we take and write the equation for the envelope term for the uncorrected amplitude that occurs it is 1 plus L plus R squared plus L minus R squared square root of that. Look familiar? Pythagorean theorem. Real simple. Um, we're finding the resultant vector from two sides of that triangle. Well, you can see there's an L minus R term that appears in what's supposed to be our envelope. And it, and it continues on with cosine omega ct plus phi, where phi is the arc tangent of L minus R over 1 plus L plus R. So that stereo term is okay. It causes no distortion. But this term, this guy here is bad. Well, uh, back in 1976, Norm Parker and Frank Hilbert at Motorola discovered that the cosine of the phase modulation term is 1 plus L plus R over square root of 1 plus L plus R squared plus L minus R squared square root. Okay. If we multiply our transmitted signal by the cosine, by cosine phi, this term cancels with this term and we're left with 1 plus L plus R cosine omega CT plus phi. We're sending the same phase modulation term, but we've replaced a distorted envelope with an undistorted envelope. Well, this actually becomes much easier in the transmitter because all we do is we apply the original L plus R term. But what does that mean at the receiver? The receiver we want to use a quadrature demodulator and the problem is the incoming signal is qualm multiplied you know, I'll draw it like this by cosine phi. So in the receiver therefore we have to take sequam, which we've transmitted, and divide by cosine phi to return it to quam so we can get undistorted L minus R. And in order to do that, we use three different demodulators in the chip. And if you look at the MC13020, you'll see an envelope detector, you'll see an in-phase detector, and you'll see a quadrature detector. Okay. All three of these are fed with, um, with the incoming RF. But we break this path, and both of these paths are broken, and we put a divider, an analog divider in there. So this gets replaced with incoming RF going into an envelope detector into a divider into I and into Q. Okay. Now what we want to do is apply cosine phi to that divider and the simplest way to do it 
is through feedback. We use a comparator. A simple comparator comes around and it takes any error, it uses the envelope term as a reference because we know it's right, it takes any error that's on the eye detector, forces it through feedback and through this divider so that E equals I at this point after the divider and as a matter of course you've also divided the input to the Q detector so now this becomes undistorted L minus R. The envelope gives us L plus R, the quadrature detector fed with RF that's been divided by the cosine of the phase angle now becomes L minus R and we have undistorted L plus R and L minus R apply that to a matrix and we can have left and right stereo. So it's a very, very simple process in theory. It's very easy to transmit and, um, and it survives well. It, it has most of the characteristics of linear QAM. It is not a linear signal. It does have additional sidebands, but they're very well controlled. And um, it's, a, it's a simple way to send a very robust signal over the air. So that that got us to you know the transmission or the reception of the signal. How do we transmit the signal? It's actually very easy. We take L plus R, that goes to our modulator of our transmitter. It's modulating the power amplifier. We take L plus R and L minus R, we feed them into an I and a Q modulator. This gives us QAM. You know, it sums together to give us quadrature AM. We run that through a limiter to remove the envelope component. That 1 plus L plus R squared plus L minus R squared. Square root of all of that. And what we're left with is the phase modulated term, which is the arc tangent of L minus R over 1 plus L plus R, the exact term that we want for CQAM, that goes and that is our carrier reference with phase modulation for the power amplifier through gain stages. The two are recombined in the power amplifier and we combine this phase modulation with this amplitude modulation and we transmit CQAM. So the actually the more difficult part of it is I mentioned earlier in the earlier video that we have time delays we have to equalize. So every one of these components has an audio time delay function to it. And that's so that the transit time from here to the PA, T1, is equalized so that the transit time through the phase modulated path to the PA, T2, we make T1 equal T2 and they add up perfectly together. The antenna system can have some effect on that, so we have some pretty complex methods of, of doing that time delay, but it's all done at audio. It's not an RF uh, function, it's an audio function, so it's quite simple to do. So there's been some claims that AM stereo hurts mono coverage, um, you know, has an effect on it, and nothing can be further from the truth. If it's done right, um, your coverage will remain identical or in some cases it can be better because you're actually equalizing your antenna system in the process but let's say it remains the same. Others have also said AM stereo is hard, you know, it's difficult to do. It's not, especially with the built-in exciters and things that were available for transmitters and are still available. Um, it does require, you know, to handle two channels of audio instead of one but you know, that's no big deal. We do it in FM all the time. So why can I make the claim that there's no loss of coverage with AM stereo? It's very simple. If I draw my, let's say my exciter, that's going to generate my AM stereo signal at a low level, it has a phase modulated path. So we've got the, that I and Q it's getting a little hard to read, but we've got the I and Q that goes into a limiter and out of this through an amplifier we get at 
our case here we get 1430 kilohertz that's phase modulated in the proper fashion this is at RF and we have a second path here all it is is amplifier time delay amplifier to equalize the delay path and this is all audio if I put a 1 kilohertz sine wave in here a 1 kilohertz sine wave comes out here this path goes into our modulator for the transmitter this path gets gained up in power goes to our PA and we transmit an envelope and phase modulated signal. In the case of the envelope modulation it's identical and so if we have left and right audio coming from our studio into our processor this is our, our audio processor one of the first we have we have some an AGC on it and then we put it into a matrix that gives us L plus R and L minus R we do all of our processing on it but all of our control functions all of our peak limiting and everything is based on L plus R L plus R is the master function here and then this can come out as left and right or as L plus R and L minus R it doesn't matter all the control functions were done on L plus R that L plus R signal if I put a 1 kilohertz sine wave in here we're gonna get something that looks like a 1 kilohertz sine wave coming out of the L plus R path that's going into our modulator and that's setting our coverage mono or stereo that's setting our mono listenership loudness density the signature sound of the station everything the L minus R path goes along for the ride it's it's kind of the secondary um, it's controlled by the L plus R and it goes into the phase modulator and creates the phase modulation path no ties between these two so and in that original equation where I said our mono signal is 1 plus L plus R 1 plus L plus R it's very late cosine omega CT plus phi okay this carrier plus modulation is all the power of the of, that's conveyed in the carrier and the envelope modulation that's your coverage that's what we try to maximize and that's exactly what we're doing here mono or stereo so I could turn this path the phase modulated path on and off as I wish it does not affect the mono path at all and so my coverage is set by that mono path and, and we proved that here WION we proved it repeatedly um, the only time there's a change in processing or I should say in coverage is when the processing has changed if somebody is not taking care to make sure that you know the mono processing is done properly the, that L plus R component um, then yeah you can have coverage issues you're gonna have that anyway you just have to keep track of what you're doing and and do it properly okay there is one unique advantage to AM stereo over FM stereo obviously we don't have the bandwidth because of the NRSC limitations we're limited to 10 kilohertz audio but because of the way that we do our audio processing there's a unique advantage to the sound field what your ears hear FM stereo is what we call substitutive so I can do 75 kilohertz deviation that's my legal limit I can do that 75 kilohertz any way I want I, it can be all mono all L plus R it could be all stereo although there's no reason to ever do that all L minus R it could be some combination of left and right but it always has to add up to 75 kilohertz so what does that mean it says that if I'm center stage mono and let's let's draw a stage here far left far right 
mono right in the middle, um, I'm transmitting uh, minus the pilot. The pilot's ten, you know, eight kilohertz. Or I'm, I'm sorry, eight percent, nine percent, ten percent of the, you know, this nineteen kilohertz pilot. Tone. Ignore that. Let's just say our seventy-five kilohertz is all coming from left plus right. So we've got a given amount causing seventy-five kilohertz deviation from left plus right. As I move across the stage. I have to split that between left plus right and left minus right. So at the far left side of the stage, it's 50% L plus R, 50% L minus R. That adds up to 100% modulation or 75 kilohertz deviation in the FM system. Same over here. If I'm far right uh, channel, go the other way. Come over to the other extreme. And, you know, look at that. I'm 50% L plus R, 50% L minus R. That adds up to 100% to give me my full deviation. AIM stereo doesn't work that way. We're not substituting L plus R and L minus R. This is a completely additive system. So I can always fully modulate L plus R and I can add L minus R to it. So what does that cause to our sound field? If we process based on L plus R and L minus R, we end up with a certain loudness for 100% L plus R, but the L minus R information is additive. So when I get to one extreme of the stage, it's 6 dB louder because I put 6 dB more energy in because of my additive L minus R. Same thing for the right channel. So the sound field is no longer flat as it was in FM. The sound field takes on a shape that actually exaggerates the stereo sound field. And you hear it right away. When you do a comparison of what AM stereo sounds like versus FM stereo, AM stereo sounds like it's wrapping around your head because if you're, if you're sitting right here, it is. It's wrapping around your head. It's getting louder um, at the extremes. Now, CQAM has a limitation of minus 75% um, in either extreme. So the exaggeration is slightly less. and But it's still there compared to FM. And the difference in the sound field is is this area here that we fill in and it's it's a lot of energy in there and it's completely audible you hear it right away let's talk about the phase modulation that occurs with AM stereo so the equation for that of course is e the phase modulation equals the arc tangent of L minus R divided by 1 plus L plus R so let's substitute 50%, or I'm sorry, 100% L minus R. So that becomes 1 divided by 1. There's no L plus R term. We have L minus R is 100% equals 1. Arc tangent of that equals plus 45 degrees. The arc tangent by the same function of minus 1 over 1 equals minus 45 degrees. So for L minus R only, 100% modulation, we're phase modulating our signal by plus or minus 45 degrees. But now let's go to left channel only. So phase equals the arc tangent, and let's do 50% L, uh, left channel only. So L minus R has a 50% component, so let's go plus 0.5 for the L minus R. And we have a 1 plus 0.5 for the L plus R component, because it's being 50% modulated as well. That gives us plus 18 degrees. So our carrier is no longer swinging 45 degrees positive. It's now only swinging 18 degrees. And why is that? It's because during L minus R only, we had no envelope modulation, but on the positive portion, our instantaneous transmitter power 
has gone up significantly. It's it's almost double, or it is double the power. So we don't have to have as good of an angle of phase modulation. We don't have to phase, phase modulate as deep to maintain the same signal to noise ratio. On the other hand, when we go to, this is for plus 50% left only. If we do minus 50% left only, now it becomes minus 0.5 divided by 1 plus 0.5, I'm sorry, 1 minus 0.5, and that goes to 45 degrees. So in the trough of modulation, where we need the extra signal to noise ratio, we phase modulate more. So when you transmit left channel only, you'll see the phase modulation against the reference is asymmetric for single channel. Now if we substitute right channel into this equation, the only thing that happens is this goes from plus 18 to minus 18 degrees for plus 50 percent right, and it goes to plus 45 degrees uh, for minus 50 percent right. And if you look, depending upon whether you're left or right channel, you're either un under this condition of 50 percent left or 50 percent right only. We flip the phase modulation. So actually if you know your your carrier reference, you could tell right away if somebody's transmitting left or right channel. The phase modulation is not symmetric and that's to compensate for the signal noise ratio. That's partially what happens is compensation for for signal noise ratio. Yeah, so just simply to wrap this up, um, so you could see that the phase modulation does become asymmetric as you go towards single channel. That is a compensating term for the signal noise ratio of the signal. Um, ultimately, we are limited to 90 degrees plus or minus. The quadrature system, as you go past 90 degrees, it'll wrap back around, um, and that's an undefined region. Um, 90 degrees occurs if you were to theoretically do 100% envelope and phase modulation for a single channel, and we limit it to about minus 75 degrees. So, um, so in, in, in theory, our maximum angle is a little over 80 degrees of, of instantaneous phase modulation in either direction. Well, within the 90 degree limit. So that overall is how the math of CECOM works. It's, it seems complex, and you look at the vectors, you look at the math and everything, it seems complex, but it's actually just a couple of relatively simple equations we all did in sophomore year of high school with, you know, with geometry and trigonometry and, and, and those topics. And when you go back and you review it, um, it's, you know, it's, it's actually a, you know, a pretty simple function. The magic with CEQAM was wanting to take the advantage of quadrature AM, uh, linear quadrature, which ideally would be a perfect system to transmit. Um, but it has envelope distortion, and every receiver is going to hear it. That envelope distortion can be as much as uh, 30, 33 percent um, harmonic distortion and about 50 percent IM distortion. It can be quite high. We want to keep that distortion out of the picture. So CQAM was developed to develop a system or to produce a system that did not create that distortion and that was easy to transmit and relatively easy to demodulate. It's not the simplest system to demodulate, but it's all done in the integrated circuit in the demodulator itself. So as far as you know, building a receiver is concerned, the IC did all the tough part. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was, as one Japanese manufacturer said, a, a very elegant solution to a difficult problem that had, you know, had been around repeatedly since the 1950s when we tried AM and FM, and AM and PM, and AM and arc sine, and uh, various single sideband systems, which have their advantages too. All of these systems have trade-offs, but when we... You know, when Norm Parker and Frank Hilbert sat down and looked at the math, and Norm said, he literally sat down and said, I need to build, I need to bend the angle, I need to bend the angle, I need to force the angle to do this. 
and Frank looked at it and said, you're doing a Taylor series. And they both sat down and said, oh, that's the cosine of the phase term. You know, these are two brilliant guys, but they sat down and recognized that. And that was the breakthrough moment when they said, okay, we know how to transmit this. Now we have to understand how to receive it. And that's where Norm Parker, Frank Hilbert, another person named Yosho Sakai, who was part of the team, and Larry Eklund. Larry was an IC designer. They came up with the feedback decoder method, and that broke the problem down into a realizable solution, something that could be easily done. So that's, uh, that's basically the story.